So I want to tell you a little bit about my story, and some of you know some of my story, but I want to relate it to uh, your effort to reach out and speak to Mormons wherever you meet them, whether it's here or back wherever you live. <clears throat> I'm from a fifth generation Mormon family, so was my husband. Both our ancestors joined Mormonism back in 1832, and uh, my ancestor that joined at that time was Brigham Young, who went on to become an apostle and then went on to become pre second president of the Mormon Church. And then I descend from him and his legal wife, then to his son Brigham Young Jr., who was also an apostle, and from his third wife, and uh, who I knew. She was still alive when I was 12. Abby Young, and um, she had great stories of how God protects polygamists from being arrested. Uh, <laughs> life growing up in Utah, you know. Um, well, actually, I grew up in Southern California, but uh, we would come. Yay! <laughs> I'm a valley girl. <laughs> and, and I... I have the credentials. I, uh, my one and only moving violation was uh, dragging on Van Nuys Boulevard <laughs> on a Sunday afternoon after church. <laughs> Did you have your garments on? Uh, no, I never went through the Temple Endowment, but I lost my driver's license for a uh, few months. <laughs> ah, teenagers. Anyways. Uh, so I grew up in Southern California, and uh, my folks were married in the Salt Lake Temple, but when we moved to California, uh, my folks found out there were beaches, and uh, they decided that was more fun than going to Sunday school. <laughs> and, <laughs> so, uh, but I wanted to go to church, and I used to put them on a guilt trip about this, but we need to be in church, you know, like, oh. Uh, so anyways... <laughs> I did not have a rebellious spirit against church. It was something I enjoyed and wanted to go to. Well, when I was in eighth grade, uh, a little Christian girl came up to me in gym class, and she said, Sandra, I understand you're a Mormon. And I said, yes. And she said, well, what do the Mormons believe about God? Now, I assume that she had been told something by her church or her parents that the Mormons were kind of strange and had a bad belief about God or something. And I'm assuming that she must have been thinking, Sandra doesn't look that weird. You know, I wonder if she really believes that stuff. So anyway, she asked me, what do the Mormons believe about God? Okay, I'm trying to think of just, how do you say this? And then I thought of the phrase that was just mentioned a minute ago, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. And I said this to her, and she just looked at me horrified, and she said, Sandra, that's blasphemy, and walked away. And I'm like, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know what I said, but, um, but it puzzled me why she thought it was blasphemy. And I was not insulted with her response. It left me curious why she thought it was so bad. I mean, I knew we were the true church and everybody else had this, these funny ideas. So, I mean, I, I wasn't surprised that she didn't believe like me. But I couldn't understand why she thought it was blasphemy. And so that didn't become clear to me for several years. But that stayed with me. Now, I don't say that you should be running around telling all the Mormons that's blasphemy. <laughs> what I want to encourage you is to say something meaningful back. She, if she were going to say something to me, she, she could have given me a clue. See, I mean, there's no clue with this. It's just blasphemy. You know, and... If she'd have said, Sandra, have you ever read Isaiah 43, 10, and 11, or Isaiah 44, 6, and 8, you would know that God has always been God. He's never been less than he is today, and man has no hope of being a God like him. If she would have given me some clue, go home and read Isaiah. You know, go home and read some verse, something to point me in the direction to find an answer. Now, God used what she said, and I want to encourage you in this. God did use what she said to cause me to think about this. But it helped if I'd had a Bible verse. <laughs> so, in talking with Mormons, you don't know what God will use that you say to them. And they may walk away and it look like nothing happened from what you said. 
I don't know who this girl was in the eighth grade. I mean, I don't remember her name. She wasn't someone I hung around with. But I hope in heaven I get to meet her <laughs> and give her a hug because she did something. No one else approached me about anything about Mormonism. She stepped out and made an effort. God used what she said. So try to think of some positive things that you could say in response to a Mormon to give them a Bible verse, point them to the New Testament, something to challenge them to go back and look again at what they think the New Testament really says. Because I believe God uses all those encounters that we have along the way to bring us to him. And it, they, they stack up. It isn't a one-time thing. Very few of us have ever talked with a Mormon, one, and that be the first encounter they've had with a Christian and ever see them become a Christian like that. It doesn't happen. When you've had a lifetime of indoctrination, it takes time for you to rethink all of the things you've been taught since a child. Mormonism has a whole worldview, the way the universe works, the way the God uh, progression, the idea that God was once a man, that men can become gods, this whole uh, genealogy of gods. That becomes normal to us as Mormons. It's normal to us to have extra books of scriptures. It's normal to us to have one man be able to stand in the pulpit and say anything contrary to all their own scriptures and it still be true. We just, as Mormons, we take the word of our prophet as God speaking to us. So anything that we as Christians can do to give them something to think about, something to challenge their preconceived ideas. And some of you have heard about uh, Micah Wilder and the Wilder family that have come out of Mormonism. And Micah is famous for telling everyone about just read the New Testament as a child. And that's so true. Uh, I find many Mormons don't spend much time in the New Testament. Most of them are encouraged to read the Book of Mormon. The young people on their missions are encouraged to read the Book of Mormon. They don't spend very much time in the New Testament, other than to cherry pick the verses that they want to use for you to uh, see what they really believe. But they themselves don't really just do devotionals in the New Testament. And so that's our challenge to them. Have you read the New Testament lately? And to adult Mormons, challenging them to read the New Testament again. Okay, so then moving on. Uh, when I got into Mormon Seminary, which is their high school release education time, and here in the Intermountain area, uh, it's the end thing for most of the young people to go to these religious classes. In Southern California, we didn't have release time. We had to go before school, which meant that my seminary uh, went from six to seven because high school started at 7.30. We were on split schedules of baby boomers in school. So uh, the one good thing that came out of going to seminary at six in the morning is as soon as I turned 16, my dad bought me a car <laughs> because he <laughs> didn't want to get up at five to get dressed to take me across town to seminary. <laughs> so uh, that part worked. Yeah, except for the ticket I got dragging on Van Nuys. <laughs> uh, so going to seminary, at this time my mom started having questions and problems about Mormonism. She read the biography of Joseph Smith, No Man Knows My History, uh, and it's still for sale today, all these years later. Uh, and in this, this uh, Fawn Brody that wrote it, she was a niece of one of the presidents of the LDS Church. And she does this historical biography showing the problems of Joseph Smith's early life, his involvement in magic and money digging, uh, then his uh, writing the Book of Mormon, which she shows present day uh, influences uh, as source material for the Book of Mormon. Then she goes on to talk about Joseph's polygamy and how one by one he started uh, taking on these different wives and how his wife rebelled against this, the problems it made in the church. Uh, and along the way, the book talks about all the changes Joseph Smith made in his doctrines and in his scriptures. So she read this, her, one of her sisters read it, and my grandma Young. 
Now, at this point, my grandma Young was a widow, and she was open to reading this with these uh, two children of hers. She had nine kids, and so, I mean, the, there were a lot of other ones out there, but um, my mom and my one aunt and my grandma read Brody's biography of Joseph Smith and started them on a quest of historical information about Mormonism. At this point, it wasn't a matter of trying to figure out what's the true church or how do I follow God. The question was, is the Mormon church true? And can I trust Joseph Smith? So I'm going to seminary to learn all of the faith-promoting things, and my mom is bringing up to me problems to ask at seminary. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, I didn't realize that uh, she was setting me up. Um, and so I would go ask questions, and uh, eventually I was told, well, you, you can't know the answer to those things until you go to the temple. You'll understand it when you're an adult. Uh, th that's one of the mysteries. Uh, you just have to trust the prophet. Well, you just pray about it. And everything was just putting it off, putting it off. Then I got into uh, Institute of Religion classes, which is their college-level classes. And by this time, I'm starting to think about some of the things my mom said and wondering what the answers are. So I start asking questions in Institute class. And finally, one day, the teacher asked me to stay afterwards. And he said, Sandra, you've got to quit asking questions in uh, Institute. You're disturbing a girl that's thinking of joining the Mormon church. And I'm thinking, we could answer them. Uh, but, <laughs> but that did not seem to be the answer. So, uh, so I've got now several years of defending the church to my mother, who's stirring the pot. And, and she didn't go regularly to church. I went regularly to church, but she didn't. And so when she would go to church, and she was going to bring all her scriptures. Uh, back then, they didn't have the quad, where everything was in one bundle, you know, had them separate. And so she'd pick up all her scriptures to come to Sunday school. And I think, oh, Lord, it's going to be one of those Sundays. Mom's going to go embarrass me and ask questions in Sunday school. Well, she finally got thrown out of Sunday school, uh, <laughs> out of that class. <laughs> the one guy got mad at her and got up and shook his fist at her and, and said, only an adulterous nation seeks after the uh, sign and uh, trying to shut her up. You know. Anyways, uh, and me, I'm faithfully trying to defend the whole thing. And I can remember <laughs> one time we were arguing over polygamy, uh, which I was fully aware of growing up. I knew my great grandma, who was the last living plural wife of Brigham Young Jr. You know, so I wasn't in the position of not knowing about polygamy. And so I'm defending it. And uh, okay, I'm 16, right? And so I say to my mother, "If the prophet asked me right now to go to Mexico to live polygamy, I would do it." And my mom just shook her head and looked at me, and she says, Sandra, you have no idea what you're even talking about, <laughs> which was true. <laughs> Anyways, so at this time, my grandma Young was down in California visiting, and she wanted to come back home to Salt Lake and asked if I would go accompany her on the bus to come back to Salt Lake uh, to help her with her luggage and uh, get her meals and stuff like that. So I said yes, I'd come back with her. When she got back and looked at her mail, she found a little card inviting her to a meeting, and she wanted me to take her because she didn't drive and I was using my uncle's car. And I didn't want to go because I thought it was going to be a bunch of old people, like me, <laughs> now. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I'm 18. Who wants to go spend Sunday evening with a bunch of old people? You know, so. Uh, not my first choice. Uh, she put me on a guilt trip, and it's so fine. I'm ah, okay, I'll take you to the meeting. And I go up and knock on the door when we get there, and this nice-looking young man answered the door, and his name was Gerald Tanner. <laughs> <laughs> and I got interested in the meeting. <laughs> and, and Gerald really was cute, you know. So... Uh, my, my great spiritual quest, 
Uh, <laughs> well, he's talking about, in this meeting, he's talking about things that uh, my mom had brought up to me through the years, but I'd never paid attention when she, I mean, you all know this. What does your mother know when you're 16? <laughs> right? Okay, so here I'm 18, she still doesn't know anything. And, uh, but here's this cute guy, so obviously he knows more, right? I mean, this stands to reason. And uh, so he's talking about all these problem areas of Mormonism. Well, after the meeting, I went up and I says, well, that's really interesting. Why don't you come over to my grandma's and tell me more? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he did. <laughs> He goes over with all these books and photocopies and stuff, and I thought, oh my lord, we're really going to talk religion. And uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and so I, I was bragging to him that I was a descendant of Brigham Young, and he says, oh, uh, <laughs> as the spider to the fly. <laughs> Have you ever read any of Brigham Young's sermons? Uh, no. <laughs> and, well, would you read his most famous ones if I brought them over next time? And I said, well, okay, if there aren't too many of them. So, okay, so he gets back. Here's a sermon that the only men who become gods are the ones that live polygamy. Well, they don't teach that anymore. Well, okay, that didn't work too good. Uh, will the Mormon church give up polygamy for statehood? And, he, and Brigham says, no, never. Well, that didn't work. Uh, who's the God we pray to? Adam. Adam's our father and our God, and the only God with whom we have to do. Well, they don't teach that today in institute. Uh, will the Civil War free the slave? No, never will. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> And then he got to blood atonement, and this is personal blood atonement, where Brigham Young taught that there were certain sins you could commit after you went to the temple that would bar you from the celestial kingdom, from exaltation. And in such cases, your own blood would have to be shed, along with Christ's blood, your blood would have to be shed for you to give, be given forgiveness for those sins, like committing adultery after you went through the temple. Uh, and as I'm reading these sermons, I'm just horrified to see what Brigham Young taught. And I realized this wasn't God speaking. This was a man. So I said to Gerald, well, I'm open to whatever you're talking about. Obviously, I need to look into my faith more. Well, then he started talking to me about the changes in Joseph Smith's revelations in the Doctrine of Covenants and how Joseph Smith was backdating theological teachings into an earlier time frame of Mormonism to make it look like, for instance, priesthood, to make it look like priesthood was there at the very beginning, but it wasn't. Uh, it was brought in a couple of years after he started the church. And he started showing me all these changes in Joseph Smith's revelations. And I thought, the creator of the universe could say it right the first time. He wouldn't have to go back and redo this. We're not talking about some translation of some ancient text here. We're talking about a man who is living, who God supposedly speaks to, and a scribe takes down his dictation, and they publish it, then why would you need to go back two years later and revise that revelation to have it read differently? And to put new teachings under the old date, as though the, that was the way God had originally said it. So I launched into a study with Gerald and with my grandma. Uh, we had a whirlwind romance. Uh, now, Gerald had come to faith in Christ before I met him, but he still believed the Book of Mormon. And if you do any study on this, you'll find the Book of Mormon doesn't teach like the Doctrine and Covenants or Pearl of Great Price. And so Gerald was using that along with the Bible to show me how different early Mormonism was. 1830 Mormonism was different than my Mormonism that I grew up knowing. And there had been all these changes. We got married, and uh, I was out of the church at that. I mean, I didn't believe it anymore. I was still a member. Uh, we had a Protestant minister, Marius, and uh, got married in my mother's front room. We didn't get married in the temple. So uh, all my friends, everybody wants to know, well, how come you quit going to church? What's your problem? I didn't know the Lord yet. I just knew the problems of Mormonism. 
Gerald took me around all these different Christian churches, hoping that I would understand the gospel. As you've talked with many Mormons, you'll see that <clears throat> grace and works are a real problem for the Mormon. As a Mormon, we want to add our efforts to Christ. And the Book of Mormon verse, you're saved by grace after all you can do. And so there's this idea that, yes, Jesus died for you so you could be resurrected, but your eternal position with God was something that you contributed to by your obeying all the ordinances and stuff of Mormonism. And to get my mind around grace was very hard. Finally, listening to a Christian radio program, I heard a minister preaching from 1 John chapter 4, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son as a propitiation for us. And later on in that verse, uh, in that chapter, it talks about we love God because he first loved us. As this minister talked about this chapter, uh, well, this part of the chapter, it finally kind of just all came together, what Christians had been trying to tell me about grace, that it's unmerited favor, as a Mormon, you grow up thinking yourself as literally a child of God. So, of course, God loves you. It doesn't, it, it, Mormonism robs Jesus and the Father of the value of their love, the value of Christ's sacrifice, because you have this elated uh, view of yourself as a God in embryo. You are basically a good person that just once in a while does some bad things. So the love of God is not that precious because it's not that valuable. It's when you see that you have disobeyed God and have been separated from him that you realize that when God takes the step to you, we love him because he first loved us, that becomes a value when you realize you weren't lovable. You were not God material. You were failing God every day. And yet he made the move to you, and that's grace bringing that to you to offer you that gift of eternal life. And you go on to the next chapter in 1 John chapter 5. It talks about how we can know we have eternal life because we have Christ. And to a Mormon, they don't know that they have eternal life. They have immortality, resurrection. They believe everyone will have some position in heaven. But only the good Mormon will have eternal life or the top level living forever with God. So as a, becoming a Christian, seeing grace was uh, a beautiful, startling experience for me. That I, that's when I gave my heart to Christ. But Gerald and I still believed the Book of Mormon, and it took us a few years to figure that one out. Uh, the Book of Mormon is closer to the Bible than the other Mormon books. We thought we could join it with the Bible because it just teaches one God, heaven and hell, uh, no levels of heaven, no work for the dead, no temple marriage. None of that was in there. And it wasn't until we started meeting people that had actually studied the Book of Mormon as a historical document that we realized there was no reason to accept it as a historical work. There's no people group for the Book of Mormon. Uh, there's no language group. There's no artifacts. Uh, you can't go to university and learn Reformed Egyptian that the Book of Mormon supposedly was written in. Uh, and, and people started pointing out to us, you know, hey, my Bible's got maps, so what's, where's a map for the Book of Mormon? They don't have one, not an official one. Some Mormon might make up a map, but the church doesn't officially give out a map for the Book of Mormon story. Well, if you aren't going to commit yourself to one location, then you have no historical tie-in. There is no sample of the writing other than what Joseph Smith provided. Nothing's been found anywhere in any dig. That is by the Nephite, Lamanite people of the Book of Mormon. Finally, after researching this, we gave that up and just went to normal Christianity, joined a church, and, uh, but, and we went into a writing and research career. We spent our whole lives writing on the historical problems and changes in Mormonism and how it differs from Christianity. God has uh, blessed that. We have seen many people come to faith in Christ uh, but it's a slow task. Most people that come to faith will point out times, like me with a girl in eighth grade, times when God touched our life 
and that God used to finally bring us to the point of surrender, you may be one in the chain of the people out there on the streets that when they finally come to Christ, maybe a few years from now, but hopefully at some point they can look back on their life and say, when I was at Manti, a Christian talked to me, and I know that was at one point when God touched my life and started wooing me until I finally surrendered. So I pray that God will bless your efforts on the street. The most important thing is to show them love, that they, they are not going to go to your church if they feel you were uh, disrespectful to them on the streets here. They have to see that we're bringing a message of love, not a message of condemnation. So thank you very much.